reflecting back on this entire conversation, I think all our regrets in life don't have anything to do, at least for me, it doesn't have anything to do with looks or my body or food. And it's crazy that I wasted so much effort, you know, worrying about that when I can imagine myself at 80 years old regretting the actions I didn't take or the memories I didn't make. Welcome everyone to Love is Lisa podcast. Our mission at Love is Lisa is to share people's stories and the challenges that they have overcome so that those who are listening in can get the strength, the courage, and the hope to be their better selves. Today, we have a very beautiful guest. She's beautiful inside and outside. You can really feel her heart in every piece of content that she creates. She has went through a tough relationship with food and she decided to help all the girls out there with her tips and tricks and to make sure that the pain that she experienced they don't have to she is definitely becoming our online bestie morgan welcome to the show oh thank you so much <laughs> that is the most like amazing compliment i've ever received so thank you um i'm really happy to be here, and i love everything you do as well as a platform so this is also an honor for me. I really love this opportunity to literally connect with the people all over the world. I am now in Amsterdam, you're in the US, and we're just having this conversation, which is happening because of social media, basically. I know. And, it's crazy. I, and honestly, I have the most incredible guests and they're the most incredible people. And you guys will start talking with Morgan now, so you'll also get to know her better. But honestly, I... I'm so grateful for this opportunity. And I wanted to start our conversation with how did, how did you get into the diet culture? Or I must say like you probably were immersed in the diet culture as we all are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how did you realize that you are in the diet culture? You know, it's so funny. I think, you know, if I look back, um, when you're in the midst of having a bad relationship with food, you don't really know you do. You kind of think you're normal or you think you're better than other people. Um, and I think that's something I witness online a lot is I see some influencers who promote, you know, this is the best way. Like, this is how you have to be healthy. And I used to think that way too. I used to think I was better than other people because... I, you know, was healthier or that I wasn't going to allow myself certain foods, you know, I wasn't going to allow myself to be unhealthy or eat junk food. And it only, it really only hit me that I had maybe a problem or a bad relationship with food when I was, you know, I was eating out with my family and, um, my dad asked if I wanted a coffee and I said, okay, sure. And I ordered a coffee off the menu and it came and it had so much milk in it at the time that terrified me. It was just like a latte. But at the time I saw it and I just started crying because I started thinking like, this is way too much milk. Like I'm going to gain weight. Like this has so many calories just from a drink. And it was just all these negative thoughts started hitting me. And I thought to my, my family looked at me like, why are you crying? It's coffee. <laughs> like it was such a, you know, strange kind of, I think, moment for me to see how other people reacted to that situation. And then, you know, it sort of, I started begin to realize like a lot of my beliefs around food and thinking, you know, I was extremely healthy were actually not. And a little, I want to say like, you know, it's, it's, I don't want to say anyone, everyone who's healthy is restrictive. That's not the case. It's more so like my thoughts were very restrictive. And I thought the best way to put it is I realized in my mind, I clearly labeled foods and habits as good and bad. So, you know, if I ate something that my mind thought was good, I would feel happy. I'd feel okay. And the moment I ate something that made me think was bad or unhealthy, even if it wasn't like chocolate, for example, <laughs> you know, even a piece of dark chocolate in my mind, I was like, this has sugar, this is bad. Um, and it was just all these, you know, diet culture rules or almost like these, um, <laughs> it's so funny because online it's marketed as nutrition tips, but all these, you know, rules or tips kind of eventually just overwhelmed my brain and made me overthink 
anything I put into my body. And truly that is not healthy. Like I think if anyone's on a health journey and they are overthinking things or eating food is giving them anxiety, then you kind of have to ask yourself, like, am I truly being healthy or, you know, is something else going on? (laughs) Yeah. Oh my God. That story about the coffee and you getting it with milk, it's, it's just heartbreaking because now looking back, you know, on your younger self experiencing such strong emotion because of getting the coffee with the milk, you would just like give her a hug and say like, oh my God, you know, so much love to you. Yeah. It's so sad because I, you think exactly like you said, I think back to my old self and I wish I could like tell her it gets so much better. And I do get a few DMs from a lot of younger girls And what they tell me when I read it, I think this is exactly how I used to think as well. And it's, you kind of feel like a drop in your heart. Like it, it genuinely kind of hurts if you've experienced that kind of pain and struggling. And a lot of people who haven't gone through it might just think what, like, why would you, why would you stress about food? Like that's so silly or, you know, but I think for a lot of young girls, it's actually a reality. And it's, you know, I don't want to say we've all had an eating disorder or, you know, a bad relationship with food, but I think every girl at some point in her life kind of correlates food with body image. And as you all know, women struggle a lot with body image. So it's just really heartbreaking to hear so many of us struggle with that. Um, But thank you. I've I feel a lot better now, obviously. That was like when I was like 17. So, (laughs) but it's so crazy looking back. (laughs) It gets better. It gets better, guys. (laughs) Keep going. so much better. Yeah. And it took me a while. Um, You know, it's obviously an up and down journey, but to say like, genuinely, I don't overthink anything anymore, you know, and that's crazy to me. That was my dream to just, you know, live life and have good memories, you know, have fun with friends and not constantly be thinking about food. <laughs> you never believe how, it'll happen. How did that... And I, I think this is just so incredible how over the course of like five years, you managed to completely change your relationship with food, change the, and of, of course, I'm not saying that, you know, you got it all perfectly and someone who is listening to it now, I don't want them to think that at one point, you know, it will be all, all perfect. There will be constantly some things that still pull you back to the old ways of um, being, but just still like you got to such a beautiful place. And, uh, I, th- I see you already even have a comment about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I think like you said, it's kind of hard to tell younger girls who are struggling that, you know, it might take you a long time or it might not, but it's, you know, it does get a lot better. And like you said, you might never feel a hundred percent, you know, recovered or a hundred percent, like you won't ever think about food or your body. I don't think that happens for anyone. Um, but you'll feel like 90%. Some days you'll feel 95%. Other days you'll feel maybe 70% or maybe you'll have a bad day and feel worse. But the idea is it's kind of like a upward spectrum. You know, it's like a, a graph that keeps going upwards. You might have bad days that bring you down, but you're going in the right direction. So that's all that matters. <laughs> oh, yeah. And also progress is not linear. So don't expect it. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm feeling better. I'm feeling better. And then one day you feel worse and you start overthinking about what to eat. And it, it doesn't mean that you went backwards. It's just like, it's not necessarily like going in one straight line and like for, for you to go from minus 100% to 95%. Um, yeah. And I, I wanted, I, I wanted to actually, uh, so now I think the question that everyone is wondering now they're listening to it, they also have similar problems and they're like, okay, so how did you go from sitting and looking at that coffee and crying to being where you are now and saying, I actually enjoyed the time with my friends. I actually go out. And I saw that, that, uh, that reel that you created of eating the, uh, how do you say that? The fear foods of your followers, like the ones that they fear to eat. And I was like, how did you go from crying and looking at the coffee? (laughs) eating all of those foods that's such a good question um so you know i mentioned it takes time and i think specifically what i did is as scary as it sounds you just have to challenge it like you just have to eat it it's like exposure therapy 
um, you know, once you begin to kind of eat the foods you fear, you eventually wake up the next day and you realize, oh, that wasn't that bad. Or, oh, I didn't gain that much weight. Or I guess the biggest fear, like if you do gain weight is kind of realizing like, oh, well, I'm still loved or I'm still beautiful the way I am, or this doesn't change the other things that are going on in my life. And kind of just reminding you these positive things outside of food and your body. Um, the other thing I did was honestly ask myself a lot of questions. Like I asked myself, why do I think this way? Why is pizza bad? Or, you know, why is uh, eating more than four me uh, three meals a day and snacks bad? Like kind of just asking and challenging those diet culture thoughts and also kind of realizing, you know, our bodies are very unique to ourselves and having to understand, you know, this idea of intuitive eating, I think really repaired my relationship with food. Cause you know, one day you're, you might be hungrier than the next. Um, and you can't expect your body to be a calculator that just needs the same amount of food every single day. Um, so I think all these things I just started, the main thing was questioning myself testing myself, you know, with the fear foods. Um, and then the other big thing, and I think everyone needs this, um, and I had this too, was a support system. Um, I never really came out to my parents about it. I don't think they would really have understood um, because I think, you know, they might've contributed to it a little bit. So I didn't want to like tell them, um, but I did have support through honestly social media and I think originally when I started posting about it, I wasn't fully recovered. Like I wasn't, you know, where I am now. And it's, it's crazy because you can find a community of people online who've gone through the same thing as you. Um, and I know like for me, I followed a lot of YouTubers in the beginning who made me feel better. And one of them is Stephanie Buttermore. I think she's like, she shares her journey about, um, you know, how she had to be like extremely toned and lean for aesthetic. And that actually ruined her metabolism, ruined her body. So I think in a way, learning about other people's experiences kind of reminded me that these diet culture mindsets and tips or whatever to being skinny or staying lean in reality is unrealistic and not healthy because women's bodies, you know, are meant to have fat on them. You're meant to, um, <laughs> you're just, I, I think, you know, aside from how your body looks, you're also just meant to live a good life. So, you know, it's like, you kind of have to realize for yourself, like, what are you prioritizing? Do you, do you want to like continuously care about your body and food? Or do you want to just like feel happy and free? And I think there was like those tipping points where I realized I'm going to challenge myself because I'm so over feeling this way, <laughs> you know? Um, I feel like that was a lot. So i have kind of go on a lot of tangents, but um, I just wanted, I just wanted to say something that might give you goosebumps now. Imagine you were looking up to all of those people while you were going through this um, journey of yours, and now you're one of those people for someone else. That's Imagine it's like, and not only for one person, for but like thousands of people who follow you and see your journey. And then they're like, maybe my parents will not understand me, or maybe my friends will think like, I am exaggerating the issue. Like, what is the problem with the food? You know, why, like, why we, and it seems like, so like, don't, don't exaggerate it. It's just like such a small thing, but you're there for them. And you say, I understand you. I've been there. It will get better. You can follow the steps. And then I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I'm getting the chills and the goosebumps myself from this beautiful experience, how you actually like serving and helping so many people without even realizing it and being that one to, to how to I like I can cry. Cause that just makes me so like, happy and sad because it's like on one side, I never wanted anyone to feel like me or how I did, but at the same time, it makes me happy that I can be that for someone, you know? So thank you. I actually feel like I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, you're so sweet. Oh, no. <laughs> you're like, Lisa, I'm never coming on your podcast again. You make me cry. In <laughs> yeah, actually. 
Um, I actually wanted to say, because I never even, because I was, when I was researching you, I was like looking at your post and seeing like what kind of topics I would like to dive deeper in. And then I saw that you mentioned that actually almost every girl goes through some kind of weird relationship with food. And I was like, I started asking myself this question myself, like, did I go through any like weird relationship with food? Because nothing was really standing out. And then I was like, oh my God. So for um for your information for everyone who's listening i'm originally from ukraine so in eastern europe we have like a huge culture of like diet um like looking after how you look and it's like super super important and weighing yourself like every day like you weigh yourself in the morning in the evening like it's like it just like considered normal and everyone around you does it so you don't realize it's weird but when i was 17 i moved to the netherlands to amsterdam and then people here didn't even have scales at home to weigh themselves and i was like how would they know like if they had a, like a good day and or they ate too much and you know gained too? and then i was like whoa wait a second you know, this is not normal. Like you're not supposed to like weigh, like weigh, weigh yourself every day and also feel guilty for eating something bad and like even have like a measurement system for it. I was like, that's yeah. crazy. Like what I would even be a good or bad yeah. day? Like if you gain weight or lose weight? Like that's so sad. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I yeah, can't but- believe that. And imagine like how crazy that, that every household has a scale and like most of the people weigh themselves every day. And I was one and I was like, oh my God, that contributed so much. And I'm so grateful that I moved to Amsterdam because not even having the scales and being surrounded by a totally different culture was just so healing in itself because I was like, oh, here, no one cares about, you know, weighing yourself and like what you ate. And then you don't, don't link like how your day went and what you ate to how you feel because you weighed yourself and you gained weight. (laughs) (laughs) That's so crazy. I feel like, you know, everyone has their story. Like for me, it's the story with the scales. And for you, the story with the coffee, when you like realize like, oh my God. <laughs> That's so true. And, but it's it's kind of funny how you say, you know, exactly how I did. You didn't realize it was like a little, not weird, but like different. Or that maybe it might not have been healthy. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, it, it's crazy because, and also another thing that you mentioned that the way how you started eating is actually by asking yourself all these questions. It's like, oh, why do I think pizza is bad? Because so many times you just think something is bad without, because someone else told you so, and maybe it was bad for other people. So it's actually good for you. And actually like even having, and I think just having actually a good meal with your friends and laughing and having all of these positive emotions is so much better for you than just restricting and not having it like on emotional level and also for your mental and physical health as well. I agree. Yeah. And um, I also wanted to ask you because you mentioned that uh, I saw someone ask you this question, which was how do you um, restrict yourself once you eat the cheat meals? Or like, how do you make sure that you don't actually even like start overeating once you eat the cheat meals? And you said like, this whole idea is even wrong that you can, you should restrict or name something as a cheat meal. Yeah, I agree. I think so. I think I know exactly what you're talking about. I've been asked, like frequently asked questions on my Instagram before and someone, you know, a lot of people ask, oh, what do you do after eating a cheat meal? Or like, how do you make yourself, I I don't know people will ask, how do you make yourself feel better? Or like, what do you do if you've eaten something, you know, very heavy or bad? (laughs) Um, And I agree. I think, you know, I've always said, as soon as you label something as a cheat, that's when you kind of should look at yourself and realize, okay, why do I see it as a cheat meal? Why is it considered bad? You know, and I think labeling something as a cheat meal will make you have this um, mentality of, Uh, all or nothing, kind of like, okay, well, I had a cheat meal today, so I'm just going to eat like totally junk today, or I'm just going to eat whatever I want. And almost like this, you begin to have a little bit of like a binge mindset. Um, And the only reason I mentioned that is because I had, you know, when you're recovering from issues, I think, you know, 
disordered eating or eating disorders are kind of like a spectrum and ebbs and flows in what stage you're in or what kind of feelings you are having. But I was having, you know, a hard time <laughs> with eating my fear foods. Um, and I would feel so guilty. I would tell myself, this is the last time, like I'm cheating right now. Like I, I'm going to go back to how I was before, you know, and you think I'm going to go back to being super clean or super fit, whatever. Um, and I would just end up binging because I was like, this is the last time. So I really think the best way to go about, you know, if you feel like you've had a cheat meal or you feel like you might have binged is to actually sit yourself down and remind yourself, no, this wasn't a cheat meal. This is OK. Um, you know, this is part of my journey. This is part of me accepting all types of foods, all amounts of all types of foods and, you know, I shouldn't feel guilty because why is there something like what's to feel guilty about? You know, am I going to gain weight from this one meal? Probably not. Am I going to gain weight from a week of eating this type of food? Probably not. You know, it's like you, <laughs> I don't want to like emphasize weight because I don't think that's the, you know, uh, I don't think that's what people should focus on. I think more so you should remind yourself like, I'm allowed to eat this food. This food is not bad for me. And it is, in fact, good for my relationship with food. Um, and something that like helped me a lot was actually seeing it as like a good thing. Like <laughs> I kind of mentioned it already, but, you know, there were a few nights where I told myself mentally, oh, I can only have one cookie um because this isn't a cheat meal i'm just gonna only let myself have one cookie and then you know you eat the one cookie and you're like oh but i kind of want another so you have another and then the guilt kind of sets in you're like oh but i want another but like i can't have another i've already had two and then you eat another one and then you're like oh my god what the hell like f it i'm just gonna eat as many as i want um and you know those moments i think are normal and i think it is stress eating. So I think everyone deals with it differently, but how I dealt with it was kind of reminding myself, like, this is a step in the process. Like this is just part of the journey. And next time tell myself if I want to have five cookies, 10 cookies, I can have it. It's not that big of a deal. Like, I think the mindset is everything because as soon as you tell yourself, no, you almost want it more. <laughs> it's like the forbidden fruit, right? You want it. Exactly. And I think, you know, I really don't believe anymore that anything is a cheat meal or anything is bad. Um, just because, you know, like, like you said, why is pizza bad? Is it because it's, you know, whatever carb heavy, but you know, like carbs are necessary. Carbs give you energy. Um, you could label like a sushi bowl with rice and fish, you could label that as good, but it still has a good amount of carbs. So why are you labeling one form of carbs as bad and the other as good? I mean, yes, you digest it slightly differently, but in the end, like, which do you prefer eating at the moment? Like, it's okay to crave pizza and want pizza and just eat the pizza. <laughs> like, <laughs> in the end, it's, it doesn't change you. I just feel like many people will listen to this and say like, oh, it sounds very simple. If you just want the pizza, just eat the pizza. But it is that simple. Like we are making it complicated. We just like want something and then we order something else and then we feel like the craving and then you like overeat afterwards. It's like, why? You know, and then just like questioning yourself on these beliefs that you have. Exactly. I agree. And I think, I don't know if this is true for everyone, but something I experienced was, um, you know, like you said, you would go to a restaurant, I'd look at the menu, I'd crave a pizza, pizza sounds really good, but no, you know, you overthink it in your head, you tell yourself, oh, well, I should have the salad instead because it's healthier, it's less calories, whatever it is. You end up getting the salad and you eat all of it and you're still really hungry because the salad was maybe less calories, you know, and it doesn't satisfy you. So then you end up eating other people's food or you end up just feeling hungry the rest of the day versus if you get the pizza in the first place, you might eat, you know, half the pizza and feel completely satisfied. And you're like, oh, I don't even want all of it. You know what I mean? So it's like this idea of intuitive eating is also helpful in realizing like you can honor your fullness and feel happy knowing you ate what you wanted and you don't feel hungry anymore and you don't feel like 
also stuffed, you know? I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> yeah. No, but that that's so, so true. And I, I just wanted to say it's once you have a different relationship with food, like you actually say that I appreciate my body, I will nurture it and I will nourish it with good foods. Actually, you start craving way less and less of some things that actually your body does. Like, because I think it's once you say, oh, I cannot have that, as you mentioned, then it's like the forbidden fruit that you want. But actually, you know, many times, most of the time, your body will crave the food it exactly needs and wants, you know? And yeah. also just by asking myself what, like what helped me a lot was just basically to ask myself after I've eaten something, how do I feel? And for example, if I eaten something that's actually not good for me personally, for example, you, if you're intolerant to like gluten or dairy and you ate something and then you don't just don't really feel good, you can just say like the next time you always know that you can have that, but you just also know how you will feel afterwards. And it's like, is it aligned with the day that I want to have? Because sometimes like if you have a meeting or like you need to be on your top energy, you know, you'll feel like a bit bloated and sluggish and maybe like a bit tired. It's like, is it the meal that will actually suit my needs on this day and if it is go for it you know I love that explanation because that's perfectly said it's like honoring your feeling and accepting you know maybe not right now but maybe after my meeting or me running around I can go and have the food I want that makes me feel a little sluggish or whatever but it's like I, I love how you phrased it because I think it, you know food can make you feel energized and it doesn't have to be a salad, you know? <laughs> Sometimes like a pasta is so much more fulfilling and keeps you going. So at yeah. least that's how I found it in Europe. You know, you're walking oh everywhere. My God. I don't understand how people don't eat more. <laughs> You know, I just, I just saw someone say, it's like someone also from the U S she posted like, I don't understand. I eat all this pasta and pizza, every, everything in Europe. And I like feel so good, not bloated and everything like feeling great. And in the U S I drink water and gain weight. <laughs> <laughs> just like, what's up with the ingredients or something? <laughs> I know. It's so funny. Uh, I also, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I, you mentioned like you've also struggled with these feelings a little bit, but was this after like your scale story? You know, you kind of also realized you had this view of like food as good or bad. Yeah. So I think I definitely have a, had a strong feelings about which foods are good or not. Like funny thing is for, for example, I didn't eat any bread when I was in Eastern Europe. Like I would just not like, very very rarely maybe like once a year like it would be a thing that wow. i would eat so or like maybe when i would go travel i would like have like some other type of meals but it was not just like the thing that i was eating when i was back at home in kiev so it was like very very crazy and then once i moved uh to amsterdam for my studies and i was like cooking for myself and also like just eating what other people eat uh here and in amsterdam everyone eats like just bread every day it's like a very normal thing and it's it just like very interesting because you start getting exposed to different ideas which makes you question your uh, beliefs and what you believed in. Um, and then afterwards I, I was just like eating everything when I was here, but then I also realized that for example, when I eat too much, like I could, could eat so much pizza because I had Italian friends and they love just making pizza. But then afterwards I feel like so tired and like I could not study or concentrate. And then you're like, huh, like I'm not restricting myself what I eat, but then actually what I ate doesn't suit me or like doesn't suit the purpose of the day that I wanted to lead. And then now I have a very healthy relationship with food because I know that I can eat whatever I want, but it just, how would it actually work for me? And also just work for me specifically, because I feel like there's so much advice out there, like try this vegan diet, try this all meat diet, try this dairy free, gluten free diet, try this raw diet, try this. <laughs> 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 and then like once no. you actually try yeah i'm oh, sorry you go ahead <laughs> I, I was just saying like and you actually try and i was like i cannot find out what's actually good to eat because people have controversial opinions and it's like scientific article says a and then uh, another scientific article says exactly the opposite of a and you're like okay i don't know anymore and then my conclusion was that i just have to listen to what exactly my body is saying like if i like ate this did i feel good did i feel good the next day and then like kind of building what you 
makes you feel good from that. If that makes sense. Yeah, I love that. No, that's that's perfect. I agree with you. I think I went through that phase too of thinking, oh, maybe if I'm vegan, I'll be healthier. But <laughs> it didn't feel good. I was tired all the time, you know, hungry. So, <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah. And actually, I wanted to share something with you because I think you would really like it as well. Um, I read this book about the brain. It was from Amen, Dr. Amen. And he basically was saying that's what's very interesting that most of the people who, for example, are depressed, they have problems with their dopamine, right? So, I mean, we're all basically giant chemical machines, but <laughs> so they have unstable dopamines and having certain foods, for example, protein, dense breakfast helps them with stabilizing their mood. And, but what's interesting is for example, girls just before the week before their period, they are actually started having um, like different levels of serotonin and actually they don't have enough serotonin. And actually to increase the levels of serotonin, you need to eat carbs. So, and that's why like oh. people like women start naturally craving all this like carbs and snacks and something sugary, you know, like you start like eating all of these foods and you're like, you, you almost feel guilty. But then once I read it, I was like, oh my God, how interesting is that? That my body is like going through something. It's like, has a bit, a bit le uh, less of serotonin. It's like, oh, you need to eat carbs and it's sending you all the signals. Like you want pizza, you want pasta, or you want like that croissant. And instead of like actually listening to your body and going for that, because, you know, if you've been having a good relationship with your, your body and stuff, it will tell you what's good for you and actually like eating it. But for me, it was just crazy to find out that that's how it, it was working and to explain my desire. That's actually crazy to hear. I mean, that makes total sense too. And I think, you know, I have the same beliefs of with intuitive eating, it's like your body wants to balance itself. So some days you genuinely might be hungrier because maybe that day or the day before you were super active or, you know, like you said, maybe your hormones are imbalanced and they're craving certain foods. So I don't know. I, I, I that actually makes a lot of sense because I'm the same every time before my period, I'm like craving sugar and it never really hit me. I mean, I, I thought it was just like a period thing, but <laughs> how crazy is that? It's yeah. absolutely insane. And when, once I learned it, I was like, oh my God, our bodies are just so smart and they know what's right for us. And just like listening to our hunger cues is like the best thing that we can do. I agree. And I w actually wanted to ask you because I know that it's such a big passion of yours to actually help so many girls out there and to share everything about, um, it's not diets, it's not, a, but just like eating healthy, intuitive eating. And also you started sharing a bit more about traveling and also just like creating actually a life that you enjoy, one can enjoy. I was wondering what is actually your dream or if you could, how do you see yourself in the future? Oh, that's such a hard question. <laughs> um, well, so, you know, my dream has always been to, I feel like I just have this urge to help others. I, I'm a very social person. I love talking with others. Um, so I think my dream as of like recent is, you know, I'm studying to be a holistic nutritionist and I know a few other like holistic nutritionists in the wellness space and I love, you know, what they preach, but I also want to have more of the approach of intuitive eating, like we've mentioned and, you know, helping girls with a, you know, healthy relationship with food while providing what I would like to call gentle nutrition. You know, like we talked about what foods can help you feel your best, but also allowing yourself all foods or maybe adding to your diet rather than taking away. Um, so that's something I'm actually hoping to do by the end of December because I'll be wrapping up my training. So I'll be fun. And then you mentioned travel. You know, I'm I actually grew up in Singapore um, and my father is South African. So I've always just had like a very international upbringing and background. And I really miss, you know, the one thing I loved about Europe is you meet people from so many different cultures and everyone's very open. And that's something I love about travel is you could go anywhere and you could meet someone that, you know, is from a completely different background, but they are willing to get to know you and spend time with you or, you know, just go on like fun little adventures. And I'm a huge believer in <laughs> the idea that life 
should be enjoyed. You know, you never know, not to be morbid, but like you never know when you might get into an accident or, you know, pass away. So I really believe like no one should be stuck in a job or a lifestyle that makes them sad. I think, you know, whether that's through travel or maybe moving to a new city, I think it's ideal for everyone. So I would hope to continue traveling <laughs> in the next year, uh, but we'll see. I have to obviously make money, so <laughs> it's expensive. <laughs> but, but it is so, so true what you mentioned that I think it's the biggest tragedy just like to spend your life and then realize that you did not spend it the way you wanted. And then it was actually, it, it will pass so much faster than you think and no time is actually guaranteed. And I actually remind myself every day, it's like, whenever I'm scared, so let me share something. Uh, I think it could be quite useful for anyone listening. It's like, for example, I see Morgan's page on Instagram. I'm like, should I reach out to her? Like ask her if she wants to join me in the podcast. And then all of these thoughts like, oh, but you know, what if, what if she says no? What if she doesn't see the message? What? If, and all the, they start like creeping in. And then you ask yourself, what if I were to die tomorrow, but actually I can create a beautiful episode with Morgan and actually it will help so many girls out there. And then you just like, it kind of removes the fear from the taking take an action part and you actually go for it and you do it and you move close and close to actually create a life that you enjoy so much because you're constantly taking that uncomfortable action because you know that you'll die at one point and then it's like nothing really <laughs> really yeah. matters. I think it's just like it's a good yeah. action taken motivator. That is so true. I think my favorite quote and something my mom apparently used to say a lot is fake it till you make it. So like when you're scared, like you said, you just have to go for it. And then you realize like if you get rejected, okay, like it's not as scary as you thought. And, you know, I think 80% of the time it'll be a positive reaction, like whatever it is, like if you're trying a new sport or trying or trying to meet new people, you know, I think most of the time it'll actually be a beneficial moment like you'll realize oh cool like i just met someone new or like you said we got to have this call so i love that that's such a good way of you know exactly life is too short <laughs> yeah and also i just want to say i lived also in singapore for six months because i went for oh, my exchange no there so it was the most awesome experience and you get to experience a completely different culture and i love that traveling all over southeast asia was the best thing ever just like with a backpack and you just go that's so you cool it, honestly, I cannot recommend that enough. It's life changing once it's, it's just, I feel like traveling is opening, is like opening up your mind to everything, to life and meeting new people is wow. I agree. And gratitude. I feel like I'm so much more grateful, you know, when you, you travel and you might see other, you know, people of different lifestyles you think oh i'm grateful i have this or i'm happy i can do this so oh that's yeah. so cool though i had no idea you backpacked across southeast asia that's so amazing <laughs> i love that no wonder I... you're so worldly <laughs> <laughs> no i just um I, I i want to say like also about the gratitude part it's it's crazy because i was in Myanmar and i met met their person who asked me to teach an English class for like a group of Burmese people there. And it was like 30 people, 30 to 40 people. And it was like everyone of different ages, like every, someone was eight years old, someone was 80 years old. Uh, there were three Buddhist monks in the class. It was, it was insane. And then wow. I was there teaching English and you know, it was people were listening so intently there was a complete it was so quiet in the class if the pen dropped like you would hear it and everyone was like was taking notes like crazy and really wanted to learn and i was like oh my god these people are so grateful for the opportunity to actually have this one english class with someone who can speak english i was like oh my god we have so much to learn and i was like i'm so grateful that i have had that experience and i saw that it's just absolutely insane that is crazy. That is actually so beautiful too. Wow. I can't imagine. <laughs> because <laughs> once you both like, I took for granted, you know, sitting in a classroom and feeling like, oh, I want to leave. <laughs> but <laughs> you might, like, me too. Like I had so many classes when I did that, but I think it's just crazy. Like it really, really, as you mentioned, opens up your heart to gratitude. 
and yeah oh no i was just gonna say i agree <laughs> and i wanted to say and before i ask my last question um where can people connect with you reach out to you dm you um that's a good question so i do check my dms here and there um i will say I, I try to check them a lot, but it is really, I think, hard at times um, to see everyone. Um, but if you do want to reach out to me, I definitely check my email. So <laughs> you can actually reach my email <laughs> through my Instagram. There's a little bit of a link. Um, it does say inquiries.morganven. But, you know, if you want to send me a little note or a message, I will see it and I'll respond to you. Um, but you can also just DM me. Um, I also read like every comment that comes through. Um, so if you comment on my post, I'll see it and I'll respond to you. Actually, I take it back. That might be the best way to get a hold of me. Um, just because, you know, I think people kind of forget, but like I, even though I might get a few comments here and there, I read every single one. So when I get hateful comments, you know, I'm reading that too. <laughs> But it's okay. You got to have like a tough skin sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, short answer. If you want to reach out to me, you can comment on one of my posts or you can email me um, the fastest way to get me um, or DM me. But those first two will probably work the best. <laughs> actually, I think it's actually even a topic in its own. It's like dealing with hateful comments online. It's like, who are those people? And what's, why, why would you like go there and ruin someone's day? No. Like, why would you do that? <laughs> It's also crazy because I think with social media, you know, not to go on too much of a tangent, but I think people will develop a um, opinion about you before they even meet you or talk to you or even like look at more of your posts. Like I've, you know, of course, like if you see one person's photo, you might immediately presume something about them. So that's one thing I really hate. And what I was so hesitant about doing social media was, is that, I was honestly embarrassed to like talk about how I had struggled because, you know, like we've mentioned, it feels so silly and almost like kind of like, why would you even stress over that? It's so small to people who don't understand. Um, but, you know, I think with everything, you just have to like look at hate or any kind of negativity in life and think, you know, I'm better than that or, you know, it doesn't suit me. So I'm just going to ignore it. Like, <laughs> yeah, um, I think. Uh, yeah, I think you good things happen to good people. So if someone's being rude to you in person or on the internet or in general, you can just think to yourself, like, you know, good things might not happen to them because they're being a bad person. So mm. yeah, and, <laughs> also probably, and for also probably they have had a lot of bad things happen to them to make them so bitter or so actually like going there and talking bad to strangers you know you cannot be happy and excited about your life and then go around and s spread negative comments on other people's pages you know there must and that's that is why so true. that's why i'm like i, I think have nothing but compassion <laughs> oh that's so nice of you i that's such a better way to put it i think <laughs> in my mind sometimes i think oh you know like you said they might be having a hard time or uh, the better way of phrasing it is anyone who's confident in themselves has no energy to be negative towards anyone else. So in a way, people that are very negative are sometimes insecure. And I, whenever I'm negative, I ask myself, what am I insecure about right now? Why am I jealous? <laughs> That's so good. That's so good. Oh my God. I, I also... Um, yeah, I think this is just a topic in its own, but just like comparing yourself to others, having the negative talk, how it impacts our own confidence is just like so huge. And whenever I find myself like comparing to myself to others, comparing myself to other like content creators, you feel so bad because it's like, I don't know, there's just something that kind of brings your own value down when you start comparing yourself to others. And, in some way but when you just realize your unique value and then you also start seeing everyone in such a positive light as well i'm still trying to I put agree. my finger on like what exactly it is but uh <laughs> this is how at least it feels <laughs> <laughs> and my last question would be what would be and it's a it's a hard question what would be your biggest future regret so now let's imagine you're 80 years old, you're looking back in your at your life and you're like, 
oh my god i wish i've done i've done that and i didn't do that and i feel so sad and now going back to this present moment you already know that there is something that you really really need to do <laughs> what is it that's such a good question I, you know the first thing that jumps to my mind is like i regret not doing what i want <laughs> like in the sense of you know not moving to a new city when you want to or when you want to have a new adventure or like you said not standing up for yourself in the corporate world or to friends i think for me it's kind of this i already regret it i think i need to have more you know strength in just in a way like you know i think being selfish as horrible as that sounds but i think you know you need to kind of stand up for yourself at some points and also realize this is my life i'm not going to let you know some <laughs> someone hold me back or the negative thoughts hold me back you know i think it's like a a moment of strength and power and i think i i might look back in the future and think dang i should have quit that job or i should have you know reached out to that person or i should have you know gone to this place when i had wanted to um, and I realize, you know, reflecting back on this entire conversation, I think all our regrets in life don't have anything to do, at least for me, it doesn't have anything to do with looks or my body or food. And it's crazy that I wasted so much effort, you know, worrying about that when I can imagine myself at 80 years old, regretting the actions I didn't take or the memories I didn't make, you know? So, um, yeah. <laughs> Mike, drop on that. Mike, drop on that. <laughs> Morgan, thank you so much for coming onto the show, for being part of this podcast. It has been absolute pleasure to have this beautiful conversation with you. It was our first conversation ever, but it did feel like I'm talking to a friend that I know. I hope you also got that mm -hmm. same energy. I did too. Thank you so much. Genuinely, this has been so fun. I feel so energized after this conversation. So I, I don't know if you can tell my face. I'm like smiling so bright this entire time. So <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you.